Matthew 11 and verse 7. When you get there, you could please let me know by saying amen. Praise God. Matthew 11 and verse 7. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you will receive it, this is Elijah, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. It was earth's darkest hour. There had never been a time period such as this time period. The Bible calls it the fullness of time. You can zoom out on the globe and geographically you can see at this time in earth's history, every single land was under the control of idolatry and paganism, except for one place. There in the center of the world, you can say, was the last bastion of hope. It was the Alamo that was making its final stand. Satan and his demons, after 4,000 years of dominion, had taken all the real estate. But there was a beacon of light surrounded in an ocean of darkness, and that beacon was now flickering. Corruption in the church. Corruption in the synagogues. Ellen White says that this was the time when demonic oppression and possession, rather, was at its height. And the very expression of human beings were those of demons. This was earth's darkest hour. It was going to be the coup de grace. Satan was going to completely blow out the candle and he would be victorious. But it was at the fullness of time. You see in the scriptures, you got the Old Testament, you have the intertestament period, and then you have the New Testament. And in the New Testament, the Gospels, there is an explosion of demonic activity. You could talk to any general, any tactician, any strategist. If the enemy has 99.9% and has now infiltrated the last fortress with insurgent activity, it's only a matter of time before it falls. But it was at this time that heaven planned and decided to move. Because, friends, when it was earth's darkest hour, it became heaven's finest hour. The Bible says where sin abounded, grace doth much more abound. The Bible says that his strength is made perfect in weakness. The Bible says that the darkness, the light, the darkness, the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness cannot apprehend it. It was at this time that heaven decides to move. It drops down its two operatives in this dark hour to begin to turn the tide to wrest back dominion from the hands of the demons. And what does heaven do? It uses two women who can't have babies. 
June 6, 1944, D-Day. The Allies invaded northern region of France, five sections of the beach, Omaha, Utah, Gold, Sword, Juno, the Brits, Canadians, and Americans. Americans had the heaviest fighting on Utah and Omaha, high casualty rates. They couldn't penetrate the beachhead. The Germans had pillboxes and fortifications, and they had to get through that in order for the main force to penetrate inland. So in the front lines with those men were the combat engineers. You call them sappers. The combat engineers had explosives, Bangalore, certain tubes. They put them under the fences, blew it up, and cleared the path to make a way for the main force to get through. It's a combat engineer's job. If he needs to set up a bridge, he'll set it up. If he needs to blow it up, he needs to blow it up. Set up a minefield, clear out a minefield. He has to prepare the way to make it straight. And so Sapper, combat engineer, John the Baptist, was dropped in the hot land zone, heaven's first operative. And he was there to lower those prideful mountains, to raise up the valleys, to make the crooked places straight. Sapper John the Baptist did his job, faithful to the end, and he laid on the barbed wire so that the main force, Jesus Christ, can go through. But now Sapper John was in trouble. He completed his mission, and now he was captured behind enemy lines in a dungeon. And he was questioning. He said, is he the one to come? Lord, would you bring me here? What am I doing here? How come I'm not free? He sends his disciples out, inquire of Jesus, ask him, is he the one? Or do we look for somebody else? Disciples came to Jesus, and Jesus said, these are John's men. He said, come on with me. And they tagged along with Jesus. They saw his miracles. They heard his, his teachings and Jesus said, go tell John all the things that you have seen and heard. And blessed is the man that finds no offense in me. Then Jesus turns around to all those who are thinking about John. And he says these words, what went you out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? John was no reed. He was not blown by the winds of popular opinion. He was not blown by the winds of popular culture. He was not blown by the winds of false doctrine. You see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were blown by the wind. In fact, they asked Jesus, what authority do you do this by? And Jesus said, let me ask you a question. Was John's mission from heaven or somewhere else? Answer me. They said, okay, if we say John's mission is from heaven, he's going to say, so how come you didn't believe it? But if we say, oh, we don't believe in John's mission, you know what they, the Bible says? They feared the people. They were convicted. Oh, God's not with John. But if I say that, oh, man, the wind was blowing and the reeds were bending. Pilate was convicted that Jesus was an innocent man. When you read the word of God carefully, you'll see that he was also convicted that Jesus was more than a man. Despite his convictions, the people said, oh, man, we have no king but Caesar. He's like, they're going to give me a bad rap to Caesar. I could possibly lose my life. And in spite of his convictions, the wind was blowing. And the reed bended. Friends, we can face pressure from people. We can face pressure from the conservative side or the liberal side. But that's why it's important to be on God's side. The Bible says Pharisees, they feared the people. Pilate, they feared the people. We got Pharisees and Sadducees in our church. 
and they bring pressure. But the Bible says, fear God. There was a man named Hugh Latimer, Latimer. And I just listened to this story yesterday. He was preaching a sermon. King Henry VIII was in the congregation. King Henry VIII didn't like it. He felt offended. He felt like he was talking about him. So he spoke to Latimer and he said, Brother, you need to change that. And then next week, you better apologize. Now, let me tell you something. This is King Henry VIII. Anne Boleyn. You don't play with that, brother. You know what Latimer did? The next week at church, you know church was packed because everybody wanted to see what he was going to say. And this is what he said. He stood up behind the pulpit and he started to speak to himself. He said, Hugh Latimer, dost thou know before whom thou art this day to speak? To the high and mighty monarch, the king's most excellent majesty, who can take away thy life if thou offendest? Therefore take heed that thou speakest not a word that may displease, but then consider well, Hugh, dost thou not know from whence thou comest, upon whose message thou art sent? Even by the great and mighty God who is all present and who beholdeth all thy ways and who is able to cast thy soul into hell. Therefore, take care that thou deliverest thy message faithfully. After he said that, he then preached the exact same sermon that he preached the week before. Henry VIII, I read it just yesterday. He ended up talking to him, and he was like, you know, basically, what were you doing? But at the end of the conversation, he said, I'm glad to have a servant like you. But after Henry VIII would come Edward VI, and then Mary, we're talking about, and I'm pretty sure this is Bloody Mary, but either way, she was pro-papacy. And so now she took Latimer and Ridley and put him in the Tower of London. You see, it's easy for me to stand up here and preach. But when the winds start to blow, when the pressure starts to blow, and when they start to take away my freedom, that's a whole nother ball game. They took Latimer, they threw him in the Tower of London with Ridley, and there was another man that was there with them. His name was Thomas Cranmer. Thomas Cranmer was a Protestant. He was preaching solidly. But then they put him in the prison for two and a half years. Latimer and Ridley were taken outside to be burned by the stake. And Ridley said something to the effect of Latimer. He said, Latimer, be strong, brother, because I trust that the Lord will either assuage these flames or give us the strength to endure it. And then Latimer looked at Ridley and said, my brother, be of good courage. Play the man. Because I trust that the Lord will light a candle so bright that it will never be put out. Latimer's death, they said, went quicker. But Ridley's death, it was a long, excruciating, painful death. They made a man stand up on the rooftop and watch them die. That man was Thomas Cranmer. And after he watched his friends die, screaming. He said, where's the pen? I'm going to recant everything that I said. I've been in here for two and a half years. I'm going to be humble. I can't say nothing against him. You know why? I've never been tested like that. I can preach all I want to, but until everybody's work is going to be tried. He was tried. And he said, I'm going to swear my allegiance to the Pope. Could I have even stayed in prison for two and a half years? I can't tell you I could have because I'm not there. But by God's grace, hopefully I can. But guess what, friends? 
To his credit, that was not the end of the story. But John the Baptist, he went all the way. John the Baptist was as firm as a rock, Ellen White says. Whether he was in the field, whether he was in the prison, he was as firm as a rock. He may not have understood all of Christ's ministry, but what he did understand, he stood on it. Jesus said, what did you come out here to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what did you come out here to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, those that are in soft raiment, they're in king's palaces. Now, everybody knew John didn't wear nice, fancy clothing. Everybody knew he had camel's hair on. Not only did you hear him declaring the message in the wilderness, every time you, you didn't just hear the sermon, every time you saw John, you saw the sermon. John's life was the sermon. And because his message was so powerful is because he lived that life. Ellen White remarks in The Desire of Ages, there are three chapters she talks about John. She said that the burden of the mission was on his shoulders. And he wrestled with God in the wilderness. And because of the mission, he was a man of temperance and self-control. And so he thought clearly. He wasn't plugged into the things of this world. Ellen White says he did his best to cut off all the ways by which Satan could assault him. She says that the greatest of God's prophets didn't trust himself around sin. He says, I know I'm weak, so I'm not going to play with these algorithms. I'm not going to waste time. I'm going to stay next to the feet of God. She says that Satan himself came to attack John the Baptist. But I like what she says. She says, but his spiritual perceptions were clear. He had developed strength and character. And he was able to detect Satan's movements and resist his power. John was as firm as a rock because he was connected to the rock. But what did you come out here to see, Jesus says? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went she out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, those that are in soft raiment, they're in king's palaces. But what did you come out here to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, more than a prophet. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But yea, I say unto you. You have heard that it hath been said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you, I'm going to take you a little deeper, Jesus says. You come out here to see a prophet, but I say unto you, he is more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Tell me, church, what prophet do you know in the Bible was prophesied to come like John the Baptist? I can imagine his mom and his dad having worship at home and they're reading Isaiah chapter 40, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And then little John, maybe five years old, says, dad, who's that voice crying in the wilderness? And he looks at him and he says, son, that's you. Remember the angel Gabriel that talked to the prophet Daniel? Remember how everybody said, I couldn't speak for nine months? Well, he came to talk to me. That's your voice. More than a prophet. The burden of his mission was on his shoulders. When the teachers of the law came to ask John, who are you? Are you the Christ? No. Are you that prophet? No. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. John knew who he was. He may not have understood everything, but he knew his identity based on the word of God. He knew his mission based on the word of God. He knew the time based on the word of God. He knew what he had to do 
My Seventh-day Adventist brothers and sisters, do you know your mission? Do you know your identity based on the word of God? The first, second, and the third angel's messages, there is no other work, no other work of so great importance. We are to allow nothing else to absorb our attention. The burden of the mission was on his shoulders. He was firm as a rock. He was connected to the rock. He knew his identity. He knew his mission. And he saw, how can I best achieve this? What did you come out here to see? A reed shaken with the wind. But what did you come out here to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? What did you come out in the wilderness to see? A prophet? I'm telling you, more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Why was John greatest? Why was he the greatest? You know, Balaam in his prophecy in Numbers said that a scepter is going to rise out of Jacob. Moses talked about that prophet. Jeremiah called him the branch. Isaiah said his name is Emmanuel. Daniel actually saw the Son of Man. And then at the river Hittichel, he saw Jesus flame like a shining sun, eyes burning with fire. But it was John the Baptist that actually baptized God himself. You know why he was the greatest? Because he got to be in close proximity and be the forerunner to the greatest of all time. John said, I'm not even worthy to tie your shoes. Lord, it is you that need to baptize me. John, he's over there baptizing everybody. Aren't you jealous? Come on, brother. I'm just happy to be around the bridegroom. He must increase. And I must decrease. There's a word called self-abnegation, utter selflessness, not, not worried about yourself. And another reason why John was the greatest, because he was so humble. This morning I preached a sermon about Jonathan. And, I, and today I'm preaching right now about John the Baptist. I came across this quote. Listen to this. Education, page 156. On the record of those who through self-abnegation have entered into the fellowship of Christ's sufferings, stand one in the Old Testament and one in the New, the names of Jonathan and John the Baptist. David must increase and I must decrease. Jesus must increase. And I must decrease. And of all them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he says, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Watch this. Ellen White also remarks on that part of the verse. She says that the disciples, they're the least, that were greater than John the Baptist. How so? She says because they were around Jesus... They got to see his miracles, hear his teachings, but John's mission was different. He was not in that close proximity to be blessed by the greatest one. And in that sense, she says, and only in that sense were they greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist. So what do we learn from that, friends? What does it mean to be great? Whoever's close to Jesus. But John was the greatest of all the prophets. Then he says, and from the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. From the time of John the Baptist, that's not too long on Jesus' clock. Until now, the kingdom of heaven is at war. Heaven dropped those two operatives in the hot landing zone, and the first one to herald the kingdom of God was the first one to be persecuted. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, 
Ellen White goes on to remark about the second part of that verse where he says, and the violent take it by force. She says what God is talking about, what Jesus is talking about, that type of violence, it's akin, it's similar to the violence that Jacob exhibited when he was wrestling with the angel and he said, Lord, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. It's a holy violence. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty. I can imagine Jesus as he's saying that. John is in prison, suffering violence, and the violent take it by force. In that moment, John is in the prison saying, Lord, why did you leave me here? Why did you bring me here? What's your purpose? You know what John was doing in that moment? He was getting violent. You see, friends, the way I see it, I see John, he had his uniform on. He was in the Christian army. His unit patch said, combat engineer. Jesus also had the uniform on, but his unit patch said, special forces division. They were in the same army, but just different divisions. And Jesus said, John is about to go all the way. I'm about to go all the way. But what did you come out here to see? He goes on to say in verse 13, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Not only did John have the uniform on, does, and me, I have the uniform on, but all the prophets had the uniform on too. And if you will receive it, This is Elijah, which was foretold to come. Jesus is telling them, I'm back in the Bible again. I'm looking back to the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi prophesied that the spirit of Elijah was going to come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And Jesus is telling them what a lot of people didn't catch. That John the Baptist has the spirit of Elijah. He had the message of Elijah. He had the life of Elijah. He was firm as a rock. He was connected to the rock. He knew his identity based on scripture. He knew what he was focused on. He knew his mission. He was not bended by popular opinions from Pharisees or Sadducees. You know what, friends? We got to be very careful too in our church. Not to be plugged in to all what's going on from both sides, watching YouTube videos plugged into Fulcrum Magazine or Spectrum Magazine. You need to be plugged into not this magazine, but this book. Because you can be swayed by all kinds of these opinions and pressures. But you know what? John didn't have time to find out what's on YouTube. He didn't have time to be reading all these things. He said, hold on, I need to be clear. I need to spend time with my God. And I don't think it's a coincidence that God didn't have him trained in those institutions. He had him trained by the Holy Ghost so that he can see a little bit clearer. And I'm telling all of us, friends, We're all humans. Our clarity can only come. Our greatness can only come the closer we are to Jesus. Let's spend more time with him. He said, this is Elijah which is going to come. Elijah has to be so serious. He has to be about this life. He or she has to be a person that gets violent in the prayer closet. That says, Lord, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. Lord, if I could just touch the hem of your garment, I know I'm going to be made whole. Lord, I don't come too far to turn back now, God. It's me and you. And you know, friends, once it's you and him, no matter what happens, you're going to stand the test. Because he'll never fail you. And he'll take you through all the valleys and the mountains. Have that experience with him today. This is Elijah, which was prophesied to come. Friends, the great and dreadful day of the Lord is coming again. 
Earth's darkest hour is now upon us once again. And Sapper John will be activated once again. But not only will he preach the message, he will be, she will be the message. And they will stay close to Christ. You know Thomas Cranmer, after he saw his two friends die, he, they didn't set him free. They put him back in that prison. And then, after some time, they took him to some like cathedral, and he had to sit there and watch somebody just preach a two-hour sermon and tell him how he was wrong and this and that. And finally, he had an opportunity to speak up on the pulpit. And those cathedrals, it was, like a, it was like a pillar, and they'll have like a pulpit on the pillar so you could speak to everybody. And he spoke behind that pulpit, and Thomas Cranmer decided to do something different. He denounced the Pope. He called the Pope the Antichrist. And he said, that paper that I signed, he said, I'm taking all that back. And I'm standing for Jesus. They took him to the execution site to burn him at the stake. And it's recorded that as the flames started to rise, he rose his right hand and he said, this right hand was the first that offendeth. And this cursed right hand is going to be the first to burn. And he put his right hand in that fire and let it sit. And he died afterwards. You see, friends, John was in that dungeon. He didn't have the people in the wilderness that supported him. They weren't there anymore. He didn't have the generation of vipers or, or any, any, any body there. He was just by himself in the dungeon, had doubts. The messengers came back. They said, John, he's healing people. We saw this guy. He couldn't even see. Now he's seeing. The guy couldn't walk, and he's jumping up. I can imagine John's mind stimulated by the Holy Ghost as they're giving the report about Jesus. Isaiah chapter 35 says the lame will leap as a heart, the deaf will hear, the eyes of the blind will see, and all the scriptures that he studied in the wilderness with mom and dad are now becoming more clearer. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives, to them that are bound. John says, hold on, he's setting people free. And I'm sure in my mind, John said, praise God, amen. And underneath the dancing feet, upstairs was a party going on. Everybody that thought they were somebody was at that party clothed in soft raiment at that party. The wind was blowing at that party. Herod, for the oath's sake, his buddies were at that party. And he said, man, I know John is an innocent man, but for the sake of this pressure of this wind, he was a reed blowing in the wind. But downstairs, there was a stronger gust of wind blowing. Category five pressure. But there was no reed in the dungeon. There was a rock. There was a man of God in the dungeon by himself. But he wasn't. Because all of heaven was looking in the dungeon. Because something special was going to happen. Something very special. Ellen White says in the chapter of Desire of Ages, the death and imprisonment of John. When I came from drugs and alcohol, I remember I read that chapter. Whoa, that touched my life. And the very last sentence of that chapter, she says this. Out of all the gifts that heaven can bestow upon men. How many gifts can heaven bestow upon us? She says, out of all of them, 
fellowship with Christ in his sufferings is the most weighty trust and highest honor. The greatest of the Lord's prophets was disrespected, had his head removed, and when his disciples came, they came to find his body without a head the greatest of God's prophets. But it was in that moment that he received heaven's medal of honor. Friends, John was able to go all the way alone in the dungeon with Jesus. And the Lord trusted him. Son, go all the way. Stay connected to the rock. Don't blow, son, I'm with you. Don't forget to know who you are. Yes, wrestle with me, get violent. But I got a word in due season that'll strengthen your heart. God trusted him. And he honored him. Friends, John was able to stay faithful to Jesus in that moment because he understood how to walk alone in the wilderness with God today. So my friends, I'm going to close this up and I'm going to say this to you. Election season is what, a couple weeks from now, right? Voting time. We know where this is ending, right? Revelation 13. And let me tell you something, friends. We're approaching Earth's darkest hour once again. And it's going to be heaven's finest hour once again. But Sapper John will need to be activated once again. And God is looking to develop a people right now who know how to walk with him, who know who they are, who will be connected to the rock and who know how to get spiritual violent in this great controversy. My prayer is that I want to be one of those. I hope that's your prayer today too. As where this world is going, we'll be ready with Jesus. Amen. Would the congregation please stand as we lift our voices in the closing hymn, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Weary 
steps may falter and my soul a thirst may be gushing from the rock before me blow a spring of joy I see gushing from the rock before me blow a spring of joy I see Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of His love, perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When I wake to life immortal, wing my flight to realms of day. My song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. Tis my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all. Father God, the Bible says, faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Yes. I thank you for the call. I thank you for the empowerment that we can go all the way. Amen. Lord, I thank you for what you have done for us because you went all the way. Amen. You laid down your life for us. And even today, you're still going all the way. Amen. Lord, may we walk only in the sight of heaven to give you glory and not man. Mm. That when you see us face to face, you can say, well done, thou good yes. and faithful servant. Amen. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. Amen. Lord, may this be our experience today. Yes, Father. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Amen.